Um, now we can really start. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about data integration. Uh, some of the material we're using for the rest of the afternoon is re reused from the analysis of single cell RNA seq course hosted by the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute now, but actually Tulula was involved in making the original content. So this is mostly the lab that we'll be using from there. Okay, so data integration. By the end of this lecture, we're going to work on the understanding of the differences between batch correction and data integration, um, when and how to use data integration methods, um, how to figure out if, if you're using data integration, if it worked, and how some popular methods work. And then we'll have, uh, you know, just to make sure we, we uh, are covering all of the concepts that are covered in the lab section. Okay, so the, the motivation is to do joint analysis over many samples. So if you have one sample, then, you know, if you're only ever going to work on one sample, you do not need to listen to anything that I'm going to say. But if you have more than one sample, then you are going to have to combine them in some way to analyze them together. And uh, the basic idea is that you normalize each sample and then you combine them. The simple way is merging. There's a merge vignette at uh, Surat. There's a simple merge function. You can just take data and put it together in the same object. And then once you have that data in that object, you can um, visualize it and do other things with it. Um, um, however, sometimes there's a problem when you do this. So this is a bit of a disaster. So I have blood that I'm sequencing um, and uh, I have done three experiments and I want to combine them and I merge them together. And when I plotted my nice UMAP, um, basically I have three parts of the UMAP that are completely correlated with the experiment, not my cells. So for instance, T cells are here and T cells are here and T cells are here. And in fact, every cell is, do, is re replicated once for each experiment. So instead of the UMAP organizing my data by cells, which is what I really want, it organized it by experiment. And that's like, you know, what do I do now? So um, the reason why that happened is because the experimental differences were stronger than the cell type differences that exist in the data. And so UMAP or clustering will always work with the strongest data that you have. Like if it sees major differences, it will group them separately based on those major differences, whatever those major differences are. Usually um, we were not interested in this particular major difference. Okay, so this was um, these these samples. Uh, this is from our, our uh, nature protocol that Tulula introduced earlier. Um, there's a 10x uh, platform with five prime, uh, three prime, and two versions of three prime. And there's a pretty strong batch effect between these kind of technology choices. Fortunately, batch correction exists as a method, as a, a, a technology, and we can go from um, our you know, cells being separated into three different technologies on the UMAP to everything being nicely organized by cells. And the particular batch correction method that I applied here, that we applied here is Harmony. And so, Matt, you know, nicely, we were able to fix this problem using these batch correction, uh, uh, batch correction methods. Um, okay, great. So merging versus batch correction. Um, the first question that I encourage everybody to think about is if batch correction is even needed. Um, so merging, as I mentioned, is simply joining the data together in the same data set. Usually, as I said, we do normalize first and then join. Um, and when we do that, we need to actually assess whether there's a batch effect that's present there. So a batch effect, as many of you know, is when sam samples cluster by batch, which is you know, a set of things. Batch means a set of things. Usually it's the set of samples that are run together using a particular um, day at the core facility or a particular technology. Um, and it is a technical confounder that definitely should be removed from the data, especially if it's stronger. Well, it, it, it should be removed from data if it's stronger than the signal that we're interested in. If it's there, but fairly weak and it doesn't you know, outcompete our main signal, like cell types, for instance, then it, we might not even care about it too much. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if it's strong, it will interfere with clustering and all sorts of downstream in, uh, uh, analysis. Um, so the the question that, so now we know about batch effect, just, just the idea of it, does my data have a batch effect? 
So if the data sets are separated when you merge, like in the previous slide, based on something that you don't expect, like technical factors, like the experiment or the library preparation technology, then there's a batch effect. Um, even if there's some kind of subtle, uh, subtle um, shift, like for instance, you have T cells represented in two samples, but they're, and the, the T cells are clusters are not overlapping each other, they're shifted, you know, that, that, you know, this is a big shift, like T cells here, T cells here, T cells here, but that shift can be any, you know, they, they could be kind of almost overlapping each other. To Lula mentioned, you can't really completely interpret the distances between these things, but usually um, if there's a weaker batch effect, the, the clusters, will, the, the cells from different experiments will probably be closer to each other, or like maybe roughly in the same cluster. Um, okay, so, um, so if you see that in the UMAP, when you color the UMAP by technical factors like the sample, usually the first one you try is the sample ID, um, then you probably have a batch effect. And if you don't see that, then maybe merging works well, and then you can just do your analysis without batch correction. Um, however, when merging, we often need to prove that integration is not needed, and I'll explain why in a second. So here's an example of our um, favorite liver uh, data set that, that we published. At, and um, uh, so this was joint analysis of five human liver samples, and no batch correction was needed in this paper. Merging the data was sufficient. Um, and we got really nice uh, UMAP. Um, there was some sample specific variation. Eventually we concluded that it was biological um, and I'll explain that in a bit. Um, so um, yeah, so maybe I should have actually gone through here and shown this plot first that um, you know when we when we looked at this map by uh, sample, um, a lot of the clusters had um, representation from all the samples. Some clusters, have representation from only one sample. So this, if we just looked at this, it's not a traditional batch effect. It's not like a systematic change with all the data. Some of the cells were specific to the sample, and but many of them were actually um, not specific to the sample. And they, they nicely clustered just by merging. Um, so this was kind of an interesting question that came up in review. Um, you know, the reviewer wanted to know how is batch effect controlled in the experiment because they saw this question. And so, um, you know, I, I'll just go through the argument here because I think it's it's this type of thing is very useful. So this is actually available in the online peer review file for this paper. But, you know, um, almost every time we submit a paper that gets reviewed, the reviewers ask about this batch effect. Um, and if we've merged it, they say, well, what maybe there was a batch effect. So you, you have to kind of prove whether you should merge or have a batch effect one way or another. So in this case, and you have to think about the argument. So in this case, you know, we um, uh, tried to show that um, basically doing batch correction didn't change anything. And uh, as a result, batch correction was not needed. So we, we regressed out technical factors like donor library size and gene detection rate. Um, the blood related non-hepatocyte clusters are very robust to that correction um, that um, uh, you know it didn't change what they looked like. Um, donor specific differences in these these hepatocyte clusters that those are those big uh, clusters that were were specific to individual samples were still there. Um, we also tried different batch correction methods and um, we got the same answers before like with or without. Um, so no batch correction method could fix that problem of hepatocytes being represented in different samples. Um, and so given that the batch effect was only on, like the sample specific effect was only uh, seen with one cell type and all the other cell types integrated nicely. And also, um, you know, none of those corrections made a difference. We concluded that, um, you know, while we don't know why there's a difference between, you know, samples having one type of hepatocyte or another, we think it's more likely that it's a biological effect and not a technical effect. And, um, you know, we, we could speculate on why, like for instance, hepatocytes are very, um, uh, 
res responsive to the environment, uh, the diet of the person, the body mass index of the individual, all sorts of things that could be quite easily different biologically between individuals. So, you know, we are comfortable uh, concluding that and the reviewer uh, said, okay. Um, another example was the paper that, uh, the, the work that Trevor mentioned yesterday morning, which is looking at human glioblastoma stem cell samples. There are 29 uh, patients represented here. Um, this was a, an interesting case because uh, as we were just discussing during the break, often when you're looking at cancer, um, the samples are usually, are, are frequently separated from each other. And the reason is, is that there's frequently sample specific genome instability effects in cancer, like big, you know, a chromosome arm is missing or something that makes a big difference in your gene expression levels. Uh, and that will be the strongest signal then that clustering will identify. Um, and um, so in this case, you know, this is kind of hard to argue because there is sample specific effects. And the reviewer said, again, you know, what, you know, I see a batch effect. I see sample specific effects prove to me that it's bad. It's not a batch effect. Right. So, um, you know, we think it's biological because all, all almost all the cancer samples that we've looked at have the same, show the same thing. Um, but how we argued that there was no batch effect here was that we tried a whole bunch of different batch effect methods and well, actually three and, um, and no algorithm corrected that problem and they all disagreed with each other. So um, we, we argued that, um, uh, that they were, you know, um, basically it's not a batch effect. It's not a systematic effect that affects all of the, um, the samples the, the same. Um, so um, just th those are two examples of cases, real cases where we published, where we were just able to merge the data and that was appropriate for that data, data set. Um, uh, and then we had to prove that it's not really a systematic batch effect. Okay, so we have these two ideas, we can merge the data or we actually do see a big batch effect, a technical effect that we wanna correct. Um, and then we need to do batch correction. So, um, so once we do batch correction, um, so let's say we're, we're going to do merging or batch correction, how, how do we know that there's no batch effect or technical effect? So I showed you one way, just looking at the, the UMAP, and you can see these big differences that are sample specific. So that's, that's good. We can visually see that type of thing on the UMAP. But there are also other ways of identifying uh, verifying if a technical batch effect is removed or or never existed. So we we can also ask if the clusters that we identify make sense in that they represent samples appropriately, uh, or if they make sense that they represent cell types or states appropriately. And I'll show you examples of this. Um, we can also check various biological signals in the data to see if they make sense. Like for instance, the cell cycle effect is explaining a difference between cell types that we should that should be explained that should be different in their cell cycle uh, rates, even if it's from different samples. Um, or um, and then um, uh, that biological effects, that interesting biological effects is, uh, kind of explain that difference. So um, this um, uh, um, if we do uh, apply a batch correction method, we also need to make sure that these effects are not ruined. Um, so for instance, we don't merge cell types that shouldn't be merged. Um, I think, you know, Tula used the example of um, endothelial cells and, and uh, I don't know, another one, like macrophages or something. They shouldn't be merged on top of each other. They're very different. Um, the most rigorous version of this is to understand as many factors in the data as you can find and check them for appropriate handling during uh, merge or batch correction process. Um, definitely more important in the batch correction process because the batch correction process changes the data. So you want to make sure the data is not messed up um, by batch correction. Okay, so um, let's go through this, these types of things with the merge example. So visual inspection of the UMAP, I showed you this. Are samples separating um, by tech, obvious technical effects? If no, then the batch effect is less likely. Um, let's look at um, all the clusters that we identify. Um, against the um, samples. So we have five samples and we made a stacked bar plot to show the representation of the samples in the different clusters. And a lot of the clusters represent all the samples. So that's 
you know, a good sign. Um, here's an example where we're looking at individual specific cell type. Uh, there's three subtypes of these endothelial cells. And we also, it was nice to see that they're also represented um, evenly across samples. So um, uh, that kind of indicates that, um, you know, you know, there, there's different distributions here. So there's definitely differences between the samples, but it's not like, um, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's in, in this particular case, we have nice even representation. Um, and then we, we sh another good check is to check if the clusters represent cell types nicely. That was the check I was doing when I showed you the blood samples that didn't merge. Um, so ideally, we have one cluster per cell type. It's it's similar to these stack bar plots that I showed you, except you can also check it visually on this UMAP. So none of these none of these ways are um, definitive, but these are the ways that people usually use to um, estimate or guess if there's a, a a a batch effect. If you really want to be definitive, as I mentioned, the rigorous way is to actually um, show that. There's a factor in the data that ex is explained by something like library type or sample, and that you can correct it with regression or something like that. You can remove it, and then it will eliminate that pattern from the data. Um, okay, so let's go through the same thing for the batch effect correction example. So here we have this big batch effect. We're correcting it with the batch correction method, Harmony, and um, we get this nice integrated data after that. Um, and now we can look at the before and after. So um, if we look at samples represented across clusters, here um, in the before, each cluster has cells from a single experimental protocol, right? We colored them by these experiments. And then after batch correction, pretty much all of the um, clusters have representation from all of the samples. So that's sort of fixed. Um, let's look at our cell types appropriately merged. Um, and um, you know, so here we're we're doing these stack bar plots and we're coloring um, the clusters by um, how many cells of a particular type they have in the cluster. And in general, um, the clusters um, should have, as I mentioned, one cell type per cluster, um, uh, and we shouldn't have that cell type spread over many clusters. So here, for instance, the before we have this blue cell type B cells spread over three different clusters. It's represented three different clusters. And after merging, after, sorry, um, batch correction, um, those are grouped into one cluster. Now we still have some differences here. So maybe the um, it's possible that the, um, a few reasons for this, it's possible that the batch correction didn't fully work. Um, it's also possible that for instance, for T cells, there are actually different subsets that are different enough from each other and um, we don't see it very well because we just use major cell type labels, not detailed cell type labels. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. The example here, the one of the bottom, actually, the IJ and T cells at the left, you said if they are shifted even a little bit, you should account for batch correction. Um, it's it, so what I meant is that let's say we have T cells that we're interested in and we label them on our individual samples, we annotate them as T cells, and then when we merge them, they're not directly over we'd like to see them directly overlapping if they're comparable, if they don't have any systematic effect. The systematic effect, like they're shifted somehow altogether, <laughs> will appear as pushing as those uh, T cell groups being um, pushed away from each other on, on a UMAP plot in a sample specific way. So all the T cells from sample one are shifted compared to all the T cells from sample two, and they're not overlapping. So the more that shift is, even though we can't really measure the exact distance on the UMAP plots, you gen the general idea is that the, 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 like, you can generally distinguish like a, um, very big shifts from less big shifts. Um, and uh, in this particular case, I'm just saying that this is a big shift, like they're totally different clusters. Sometimes you can get a little bit of overlap, but they're not perfectly overlapping. Um, and they'll be like shifted all in one, you know, like they'll be, you know, instead of like this, they'll be like this. Okay. But would there be any way to add a number of clusters? 
Uh, they won't be, if you annotated, well, I'm talking about using the cell annotation labels to do the comparison. Cluster numbers could be different uh, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, so whenever we do a clustering, the numbers are kind of arbitrary, arbitrarily defined, unless you set them. If this example, T cells and NK cells, if the NK said T cells, would you consider that they're the same? Problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't quite get that question earlier. So if you're saying this was T cells and it was from a different experiment? Yeah, if they both say T cells, I would still need to do the rest. Um, if they were from different experiments. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I don't have an example of, to show the kind of slight overlap version. Okay. So um, when we're doing this correction, we need to understand that the data is being changed. Um, and it's possible that these methods overcorrect, which means they remove important signals in the data or important variation of interest. So for instance, the cell cycle, Tallulah mentioned this a little bit, but the cell cycle could be removed and that would be important. Like we wouldn't want it to be removed, but it's it's automatically removing it. Um, cells of different types or states will be merged. I talked about that. Uh, another example is samples of different types will be merged, like two different tissues. That would be like an extreme example of just everything gets pushed together. Um, so it's we need to take care to um, check that those things are happening. So whenever we're, um, you know, a, a good way of doing this just generally is when you start with your data, it's good to kind of learn about each sample individually. So you look at the sample, like one sample at a time, you do annotation on it, you examine things like variables of interest. Like if you're interested in the cell cycle, you do, uh, you look to see if uh, you can predict cell cycle stage for the different cells and you look at the patterns involved in those cells. And so you kind of get to know the variables of interest, how they look in the individual sample. And then you can do it for other samples. And when you merge them, if those things are lost, if those patterns that you expect to be there are lost, then it's probably over merged. It's in that case, or sorry, over, over uh, corrected. Um, um, some integration methods are just known to be more harsh and prone to overcorrection. A common example people cite is Surratt's CCA or canonical correlation analysis method. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then there's also the problem of undercorrection, which it fails to remove all of the batch effect. So in these cases, often people will try a different batch correction algorithm. If it's, you know, if you're finding that things are overcorrected or undercorrected, try another algorithm to see if it um, if it doesn't do that, um, because they definitely have differences in terms of how harsh they are. Um, and people who do, uh, um, feel free to, people who are analyzing data more frequently than me, please jump in if I if they have any other tips. Um, okay, so how does batch correction work? Um, the general idea is that similar factors or signals in the data, like cell types as a type of factor or signal in the data, um, across samples will be identified. And um, the algorithm will correct the overall data such that those similar signals align on top of each other. Um, so you can imagine, let's say, take cell types. Um, let's say we, we, we kind of just naturally want these T cells and these T cells and these T cells to be on top of each other. So the algorithm, Autom these state batch correction algorithms automatically identif identify a way that you can kind of correct the data so that those things lie on top of each other. So we're taking a signal in the data, in this case, T cells, and we're aligning that signal. We know those should be on top of each other. So we put them on top of each other and we make note of how we change the data such that that worked. And then we do that for the whole data set is kind of the general idea. Um, so, um, Okay, but I'll go through different approaches that people use for this. Um, so there's a lot of slightly different ideas around how to do that. Um, so, um, so what is so? Uh, the title of this of this section was data integration, and I've been talking about batch correction. So, what's the difference between batch correction and data integration? I find people sometimes use these terms interchangeably. So, I just want to clearly explain, in my view, 
A batch effect is what I mentioned. It's a batch, like a set. A batch means a set of things, and usually it's a set of samples run together um, on the same day at the core facility or individual samples. Um, and that is a technical confounder that usually should be removed from the data. You usually want to remove it. Um, but a batch is just one factor of many that could exist in the data. We've talked about all sorts of factors. Tulula talked about confounding factors. We talked about cell cycle as an interesting, potentially interesting factor. So batch is one factor, but there's lots of other factors. Batch correction methods actually work with any type of factor. They don't actually understand anything about the meaning of these factors. They're just looking for ways to align the data, although you could you know, tell it that cells should be overlapping. Um, depending on the batch correction method, they can just find any any way of overlapping, uh, of making sure things overlap. Um, and so a more general term for batch correction methods is data integration. And the data integration idea is that you're just going to try and push the data together so that the signals align if they're not aligned um, through whatever factors are, are different. Um, and this is why it's sometimes dangerous because they could, depending on the method that you use, it could, could correct the batch cor the batch problem, the technical effect that you're trying to correct. But then there are other factors that are also corrects and gets rid of, right? The difference between them. So um, uh, just good to know that. Okay, so I wanted to talk more about factors. So what do I mean? What do we mean by factors? Uh, we've thrown this word out ar around. There's uh, generally the idea is it's variation in the data caused by biological or technical factors. So factors again. So we have this idea of confounding factors. Typically, those are nuisance ones that we're not interested in, as Tulila mentioned. And sometimes they could be correlated with a factor of interest, in which case they would interfere with our analysis because we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the technical thing and the biological thing because they're correlated. Um, the theoretical version of what a factor is, is that it's a factor in the data is usually caused by a process, like a physical or biochemical process, like a pathway operating like a cell cycle. Um, that by running the cell cycle by running a bunch of genes are affected they, they change you know lots of genes go up and down because the cell cycle is there um, and that process that causes what basically cause those genes to be correlated in some way and that is what the factor fits or you could say that correlation which is you know um, those genes that are correlated they're organized now in relation to each other um, along and and so some aspect of the variance of the data is now um, basically caused by that factor. Um, so there's lots of different factor examples that we've talked about, um, and uh, some of them are technical, some of them are biological. Some of the biological ones we don't even care about, so we wouldn't be interested in them. So other ones we would be interested in. So it's just good to think about different ways that signals or processes that generate correlation because they have a common cause could occur in your data. Okay, so um, actually, you know, I, I um, okay, I'll, I'll come back, back to it. Okay, so what is a factor in the math sense? So I think everyone knows that the word factor is um, a number that divides another number, another number evenly. So one, two, three, and six are factors of six. So you can consider those to be types of parts of six. So you could you make you have a type of part of six called a three, and if you have two of them, it makes six. Um, and you know two is another type of a part of six. If you have three of them, it makes six. Um, so there are different ways of making six. Um, so when we talk about factors in a single cell genomics data set, we can think of it as um, factors of a cell by gene matrix. And while simple numbers are very easy to think about factors in matrix mathematics. Um, they're also a similar idea where you have types of parts of a matrix that are factors. Um, and you can, um, uh, it just with matrices, matrices, there's like lots and lots and lots of ways of thinking about these things, even there's linear ways and there are nonlinear ways. So for instance, a linear, com a linear component or a vector can be a factor, and I'll show a picture of this. Um, and a set of these components could be combined via multiplication to form the original matrix. So you can decompose the matrix into factors and you can recompose it. It's kind of like dividing and multiplying. Um, and the data within that component are correlated along a linear axis. And PCA is one way to find such linear components. So if we have a bunch of data here on two axes, PCA might find variation on two of these axes um, that is kind of, you know, PC1 will be 
you know, this, this um, axis of variation, which is basically the, ver you know, the variation along this line, and PC2 is um, uh, the variation on this line. So um, each of these PCs explains some variability in the original data set. Um, PC1 explains most of the variability, and PC2 explains some of the variability. Um, if you take any point here in this 2D data set, you can, exp you can define it in terms of a position on this line and a position on this line, just like you can define the point as a position on this, you know, the X and Y axes. So, um, you know, any, any, you know, coordinate system that you rotate around this will be, have that property, right? Um, but, you know, you can think about this as, um, you know, seemingly like a natural axis of variation in this data, right? If we were to look at this data, we would say, oh, there's some weird correlation here, probably is explained by something probably created by a process in biology. Those processes will basically create that correlation, as I mentioned, in our matrix. And, you know, when we see that correlation, so there's probably some meaning associated with it. Um, and, you know, there's correlation in, in that the big correlation is here, but there's also correlation um, of these these points along this axis, and that might mean something else. So maybe PC1 is a cell type and PC2 is the cell cycle variation or something like that. Anyway, so I just wanted to kind of explain some general ideas about what fact these factors are, because data integration really relies on um, think on, on identifying these factors and, and aligning them. So their assumption when, when we do data integration is that a significant portion of the biological variability, each factor can be considered one type of variability, like this is a type of variation and this is a type of variation. They're, they're factors. Um, you can combine them both to get the, the whole picture, but each one separately is like a part of the picture, right? And, um, and you know, these data integration methods um, identify the, try to, in various different ways, try to identify these factors that are similar between data sets. And then that's what gets aligned. That's what gets pushed together. Um, and then all the rest come for the, all the other data comes along for the ride based on the um, uh, alignment uh, process. So for example, so, so to do integrate data effectively, there needs to be some sharing of factors between the data um, of some kind, like cell types. Um, linear, linear or nonlinear factors are possible. It doesn't have to be nice straight lines like this. It could be all curvy lines. It could be basically anything. It's like infinite possibilities, actually. So um, typically in the data integration methods, um, factors are automatically identified and aligned. Um, so we don't really need to worry about them too much. Um, and um, however, the identified factors may be hidden, so they're not really easily extractable by us for you know to to think about what they mean um, from the integration process. Sometimes the integration process is just pushing things together, but it doesn't tell you exactly how it's doing it. Okay, so now let's move to another topic: integration methods. So, key take home: there's lots of different e integration methods. Um, and there's no theory that tells us which one we should use. Um, so I can't tell you, given your data set, if you should use one integration method or another, just like I can't tell you if you should use one clustering method or another, or what your clustering resolution is. Um, and the reason for that is that there's actually a theory that tells us we can't have that theory. <laughs> actually, I can't, I can't tell you that. And um, because there's, uh, it's called the no free lunch theorem. And um, you can read up about it. it's very fairly theoretical, but um, it actually states that any two optimization algorithms are equivalent when their performance is averaged across all possible problems. And it implies that there's no single best method for optimization, but basically anything in machine learning uses optimization, clustering uses optimization, data integration uses optimization. So they're all related because they're all use optimization. And we don't know a way to figure out in advance based on the, math, the data set, whether one optimization method is going to be better than another. So, um, so we can't, unfortunately, use theory to tell us anything useful about choosing these methods. 
Um, what we can do is benchmark methods and use practical experience to figure out which methods are working and which methods are not working frequent, roughly on the types of data that we're interested in. Um, so, um, uh, okay, so let's go through some um, integration methods just to get a sense of how some of them work. And then I will talk to you about benchmarks and we can see how um, uh, people have approached the, how to choose the integration method problem. Okay, so Harmony is a popular integration method. It's probably one of the most popular ones right now, I would think. Um, it is um, uh, fast and generally works well in practice. And you know, many people will say, why don't you start trying, start uh, analyzing? Like if you're gonna choose an integration method to start, why don't you try Harmony? Because it frequently works well and it's pretty fast. So it's kind of low cost. Um, so the way Harmony works is you have your, um, it tries to put the cluster, it tries to push the clusters on top of each other that should be on top of each other. So if you have, um, uh, um, uh, um, it, so, you know, if you have clusters from different data sets, so these different colors are the different data sets, the different um, shapes are different cell types, and um, basically, uh, Harmony iteratively tries to push the data so that the cell types are on top of each other, um, and um, it keeps track of how it's pushing pushing the data that way. Um, but by the end of it, kind of all the data is pushed on top of each other. So um, uh, it, the way, you know, a little bit more detail about how it works: it merges data sets or it integrates data sets represented by top principal components which are then used to cluster cells. And each cell is iteratively adjusted using an estimated correction vector shift to, to get it closer to central, uh, the, the, the cluster centers overlapping until it is, can't do it anymore. Okay, so um, that's kind of gives you an idea of how people do this. In this case, it's kind of iterative shifting until everything is aligned. Um, one of the interesting things with Harmony is that we don't really know what the factors that it's using are um, because it's kind of just following a, a path that it, it tries to do as best it can. Um, a very early method, um, these methods only really came out in 2000, like not, like five years ago, I think was probably the first integration methods, right? Um, so they're pretty new. Um, one of the first ones was based on this idea of mutual nearest neighbor. So if you have two data sets, you can identify cells like a cell in one data set that's closest to a cell in another data set and the cell in, okay, let's say we have two data sets A and B. Let's take a cell in data set A and find its closest cell in data set B and then take all the cells in data set B and find its closest cell in data set A. And if those two cells are their mutual closest, closest similar, then they'll be the best match for each other and they should be matched up. Um, so those are called anchors in these particular way of doing things. And they're used to estimate and correct the cell type specific batch effects over the whole data set. Um, so um, uh, here we have two batches from this uh, um, MNN uh, correct paper, I think. Um, and, uh, oh, is this, yeah, anyway, uh, okay, is this, do you remember which, uh, anyway, I forgot the name of the method, but anyway, uh, conceptually, um, it is, um, you know, finds these pairings of cells between the data sets and then estimates correction vectors to get them to figure out how to change the data so that they, you shift everything to be in line with each other. Um, canonical correlation analysis is one that I mentioned. It was one of the first uh, data integration methods that was published um, also about five years ago. It's, and it was in Surratt, so people were using it, were excited to use it when it came out. Um, what it does is it takes uh, two different data sets and then it finds um, uh, factors in the data that it should align. And then it uses this thing called dynamic time warping to um, locally stretch or compress the vectors during the alignment to um, basically, if they're not like linear related to each other, it can kind of, uh, it can kind of, uh, um, handle messiness in the in the data in some way. So um, the problem was is that 
it, over time, people found that it, it, it actually frequently overcorrects data. And so it's considered a harsh method, but it's actually good for tougher integration problems that are where the data sets are really different from each other. Um, there was a new method that came out, a newer method that came out from Surratt afterwards that tried to replace CCA after the Surratt authors figured out that it was not always working very well. Um, and this one projects data sets into each other's PCA space. So it actually uses these factor ideas um, and then um, you know, tries to match, find the best matches of, of, of aspects of the data and then corrects the whole data set. And it's less harsh than CCA now. In general, it performs pretty well. And Surratt now recommends it on their um, integration website. Um, I don't think they've published this yet, uh, our PCA. No, they haven't yeah. published it because they didn't make enough differences and updates to publish it. Uh, essentially, it's just projecting into PCA space. Everyone's been able to do that forever. And then it uses the MNN correct method to identify matching methods. Well, that was published by MNN correct. And they just put it together after a conference where everyone was like, you know, we really like your integration method, but it tends to merge things that don't match and it, to, to the Surat guys and to the MNN correct people going, we really like how it matches the, the snow pipe stuff really well, but it doesn't actually correct it very well. So then they said, okay, we'll put these two, two together into Surat version three and then do that. Yeah, so, so I don't know if they'll ever, it's actually hard to figure out how, what it does because they never really explained the full method. Um, but if you go to this, like, if you go to this website, it roughly explains it, but, um, you know, they don't even explain it as, as well as Tallulah did. So, um, so uh, still be nice if they published it. Okay, so the last method I'm gonna mention is one called Liger. Um, this is kind of funny, I guess. It's a name for a, a mythical lion-tiger mix. So you can take a lion and a tiger and you can integrate them, make a Liger. And the, the idea here is that, um, so this is also interesting as a cell paper, just some commentary. They just took an existing method and they applied it to single cell that was previously developed for multi omics data integration and they applied it to single cell and they published a cell paper and cell. Um, but they, um, uh, so they basically took this other method that was published a few years earlier, um, a non negative matrix factorization method for detecting modules and heterogeneous multi omics or omics multimodal data. So basically, what that means is that you can take data that's fairly different, like you can take ATAC seq data and transcriptomics data, and you can integrate them, um, I, I, ideally. So um, the method that they use finds specific factors that are common between the data sets that you're integrating and factors that are unique to individual samples or data sets that you're integrating. And then it, um, it uh, basically uses all of that together to kind of merge, focusing on the stuff that's common, but it keeps the stuff that's unique. So one of the interesting things it can do is that if cells are in, are specific to one data set, it can it can keep them or save them. It doesn't it doesn't, you know, it models it explicitly at, at, at least. I don't know if it, you know, nobody's proven if it um, is, you know, better than other integration methods, for instance, at handling cells that are unique to a data set, but that was one of the things that they talked about in their paper. Um, and it also can identify these features um, in some way, although I don't think we've ever, I don't know if we've ever used that information. I, I don't know how easy it is to access it, um, but the original method does identify these factors. Um, Okay, so um, the final, so those are all the kind of standard types of integration methods where the idea is you take different data sets and you integrate them, right? Um, uh, the, um, just a note on wording, it's confusing sometimes to the, the difference between merge and integrate. Um, frequently people just make mistakes in interchanging those. It's clear if merging is the, um, just grouping things together with no batch correction, no factor correction. Um, and integration is one of these data integration methods that does this factor alignment and correction. Um, and uh, that's, you know, in, in Surratt, the functions are called merge and integrate. So that helps. But um, even the papers here um, talk about merging sometimes when uh, they mean integration. So there's, it's really just a... Um, a uh, convention in the field that those have 
to have those meanings. It's not really English that defines the difference, but it'd be better maybe if they had better terms. But anyway, just a quick note about that because uh, sometimes it's confusing. Okay, so I talked about these methods that merge that integrate data um, together. Um, base basically, each data set that's being integrated is kind of an equal citizen when that's happening. It's not like one's better than the other. There is a newer kind of integration method called reference-based integration method, which um, uh, takes a reference, which means it's like the textbook example of whatever, whatever data set we have, like someone's published the best lung map. And everyone agrees that that lung map is amazing because they really took care to annotate everything properly and it's really high quality data. And so that's going to be our reference that we, you know, are going to compare everything to. And, um, uh, and so then we can kind of take our data that we've created, say we have some lung data and we want to integrate it with the reference to check if our data, how similar it is to that reference, that we get all the same cells that they do, or we get new cells. Um, and um, so overlaying that is kind of this idea is reference-based integration. So in this case, there's one data set that's unequal and the, the data sets are unequal. One's considered like the gold standard and the others are pushing themselves to that gold standard. Uh, the, the previous integration methods could allow both data sets to be shifted around um, even if it was gonna change one of them or, or change both of them. Okay, so sometimes the, you know, the integration methods like Harmony and all those others that I mentioned, they, they work pretty well, but sometimes they, they're hard to use. Um, the biggest time that we found they're hard to use is when you have a lot of cells and you can't fit them all into memory to actually operate, to run the, the method. Um, and then, you know, one way of addressing that, I'll talk about it in a bit, what, you know, one way of addressing that is just buying a faster, a bigger computer with more memory. But eventually, you're probably not going to be able to fit all the cells that we have, like maybe 10 years from now, when you run this course, we'll be, instead of thinking about experiments that measure 10,000 cells, we'll be thinking about experiments that measure a billion cells at once or something like that, right? I mean, it could happen. And then um, we're not going to be able to fit those into memory. We're definitely going to have to have different ways of thinking about the problem. So um, uh, because memory is not, we, we don't have that much memory uh, to, to you know, manufacture. So, um, uh, okay. So the in the case of reference-based integration, the query sample should be similar, like the same tissue, same biological context, like healthy samples. Ideally, like we can take healthy lung that we're looking at and match it with a lung reference. Um, and um, uh, this is very useful if you want to kind of use prior data that's been published that is the kind of gold standard maybe in the community, like human cell ALICE data or HubMap data that people have decided is, is valuable. Um, so, um, uh, okay, so just a bit of commentary. It's a bit newer, um, it's less used, and I don't know of any benchmarks that, um, I don't know if anyone knows any benchmarks that have tested these things. So as of 2023, um, there are examples out there, but not a lot of practical use to compare them and knowing which ones are better. Um, a really, um, so Surratt has one. If you go to this link, uh, integration mapping you can find instructions for how to use it. Um, the Surratt group, the Satija lab in New York, uh, has created a nice website called azimuth.hubmapconsortium.org where you can load up your data and map it to a library of references. The only problem is they probably only have a dozen or maybe 20 different references and most most probably your tissue is not represented. I mean, there's some nice ones, but um, it's not comprehensive. So they'll build that up over time, but right now it's still growing. Um, there are other methods like Symphony is one that I understand some uh, people in the community are using here uh, that we, we know about. Um, and it claims high performance, but I actually haven't, well, my lab hasn't tried it. Um, okay, any questions so far? Um, okay, so last section is data integration benchmarks. There are two big benchmarks for um, data integration methods. The first one was really focused on, they called batch correction methods. Um, and they concluded that Harmony, Liger, and Surratt 3, which is the RPCA, um, uh, I think, right? That's, uh, no, 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 that's 
So they call it CCA plus MNN. Is that yeah. it's it's, RPC? It's for the periods when they added the MNN functionality to both RPCA and CCA. So it's CCA and RPCA and MNN. Right, right, right. Okay. So um, it's a little bit confusing, but um, they recommended that these are good. And they said that because Harmony is faster, you might as well try it first. Um, but a lot of methods work well. Uh, they benchmarked 14 methods. So that was in 2020 when they benchmarked these methods. Um, and in 2021, there was a bigger method benchmark that came out. This is more influential um, recently, but they used 20 methods and they claimed that ScanV, Scanorama, and SCVI and SCGen perform well, particularly on complex integration tests. So they had a lot more details, but um, so far, you know, definitely people are using these, but I haven't seen people shift away from Harmony too much. I don't know what you, uh, you folks are using. A lot of those are Python ones. So still the community is mostly based on R, which is what you're seeing. Thread Harmony, because they're R-based. Uh, Scanvy is based on Python. Yeah. So it's is now becoming more popular because more and more people are moving to Python. And it's it's the easiest to use with Python, Python packages is SCBI and Scanvy. Yeah. And they have a new uh, initiative called SCVerse that's trying to integrate and make these things better and easier to use. Um, so over time, there might be different preferences. A lot of times in bioinformatics, um, you can have a lot of different tools that do roughly the same thing. Some of them will be provably better than others, but people won't shift to them because it's not does. They're actually even though they're better, they're not very much better. They're like a little bit better, and so provably better, but not substantially better. And for practical purposes, people just choose the easiest one. The best example of that is that everybody uses Blast because it's easy to use online. The NCBI, they make it so easy. There's hundreds of methods, probably at least, that um, have tried to be better than Blast, um, but nobody uses them because you have to install them yourself and make your own databases, and there's no easy website. So um, I think that kind of thing happens a lot. Um, uh, and and in the end, it's practically doesn't matter frequently because it's not going to change the results, uh, your biological conclusions. If you're interested in comparing them, I would encourage you to think about it in terms of whether one method or another will actually change your biological conclusions. So define, go th go forward with one method, come up with biological conclusions. If you have a question, if you want to know if your um, method choice or parameter choices are going to be important. Uh, try them after you've done that, and then you can test whether it's changing your results or not. And if it doesn't change your results, then it's not uh, relevant for that conclusion. Um, so uh, that's kind of a practical way of uh, approaching that problem. Um, okay, so a uh, couple more points. Um, the, you know, I mentioned um, in the beginning, how do you know if your batch correction or data integration method is working? And we can use these stack, people tend to use these stack bar plots and look, look at UMAPs um, with some general rules that I, I mentioned. Uh, there are, however, a whole bunch of different metrics that people are developing to more uh, precisely quantify the amount of um, correction that is occurring. Um, there's various different statistics. Um, in the Lucan 2021 paper that I mentioned as one of the benchmarks, they had two types of met metrics. So one is batch effect, which is like technical factors. And the other one is conservation of biological variants, which I would call biological factors. So, um, and then for the biological factors, there's obviously different types. So they divided them into different things like cell type labels, um, and then things that were not cell type labels. So, um, they had things like, um, uh, cell cycle conservation, highly variable gene conservation, trajectory conservation. Um, so those are other biological signals that they decided. You could have added a whole bunch more here. Like you could have, why just cell cycle? What about the other hundred pathways that exist? Um, each one of those is a factor probably if it's active in your data and could be used to evaluate how good this, these methods are, are working. Um, they published that that Lucan paper published a um, a nice big table that kind of lists all sorts of uh, uh, results and how well all the different integration methods worked. Um, you know, here's Harmony. Um, check mark is green. Check mark is good. Um, okay, so a couple of additional points, like just practical points 
touched on it a little bit. Integration, if you're running it on very large data sets, need a lot of computer memory. Um, one of the things people do to, so there's a couple of things you can do about that. You can buy more computer memory or you can find a computer with more memory. You can find computers with very large amounts of memory, like, um, you know, terabytes of memory. And they'll be, much, you know, you'll probably also satisfy most of your integration tasks with these things. Um, but uh, usually you get them at a supercomputing center that you have access to. Um, however, um, Python, just to be aware, is is um, something that people switch to because it, it tends to be more memory efficient than R. Um, it traditionally has not been as popular as Tulula mentioned um, because there's just a lot more functionality in R and it's easier to use typically. Um, uh, but if you're getting, if you're really getting to big data sets, then this is one option. And then reference-based integration may be useful uh, as a way of integrating these data sets. And then there's lots of research in this area um, especially with deep learning, there's going to be really interesting new ways of thinking about this problem and it, and they're going to solve this memory issue because most of the data that we are work with is just repetitive. It's like the same cell over and over and over again. We have lots and lots of examples of them. We don't need to represent each cell as a separate vector. We could just represent them as a, as a factor or something and then have it all learned automatically. And that's probably what's going to happen in the future. Um, so, um, uh, okay, so, uh, last point, uh, just a practical point, calculating differential expression after integration, after batch correction in particular. Um, Tulula mentioned ways, practical ways to compute differential expression. One of the problems that most popular integration methods have is that they don't produce a corrected cell by gene matrix. They don't, cor they don't correct the gene expression matrix. They do result in updated PCs and clusters. Um, and a lot of people, Basically, in fact, Serrat itself, the last I checked, recommends that you just um, use the updated clusters, but do differential expression testing on the original data set, which doesn't make sense because um, as if you took the RNA-seq course, you know that, and even as Tulula mentioned, that um, you, know, you can correct batch effects in the differential expression test, and you should, um, but Surat, as far as I know, doesn't have any way of doing that in it unless they changed it recently. Um, there are methods that do it. Tulula mentioned already some, but just be aware that um, that uh, the integration methods have not integrated very well yet with the differential expression uh, um, methods. Uh, although there are some um, some integration methods that are doing a better job now, so it's. Less straightforward compared to how it is with bulk RNA seq. Um, I don't know if Tulu, if you have any other practical things. Like once Harmony corrects your data, you you don't have access to that correction factor to use in a regression, no, for instance. No, so Harmony yeah. doesn't touch your gene expression at all because it doesn't even know your gene expression exists. Harmony sees you have PCA cells in PCE space and creates a new PCA space for your cells that come together. It doesn't know anything about the, the raw uh, gene expression. There's been lots of debate about whether you should use uh, your post batch effect correction data. So some will correct the gene expression matrix, whether you should use that for differential expression or not. The last conclusion I heard was probably not, which is why most batch effect correction methods don't correct the count matrix because we don't want to correct it because we believe those batch effects are biological variation, not technical variation. Do, whether we know that's true or not, we don't really know because we can't really do a technical replicate of single cell RNA, right? We can't take the same cell and sequence it twice to see what was what is technical variability versus um, biological variability. So right now we're, we're just assuming it's all biological noise, not technical noise. So we should leave it and consider it as technical replicates or biological replicates. That may change in the future. That's where we are now. Yeah, so that's just a practical note. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. Um, what did we learn? Uh, it's good to verify if batch correction or data integration is even needed before applying it. Don't just automatically apply it. That's not a good idea because it can change your data and can remove important parts of it uh, sometimes. Um, 
So sometimes merging data is sufficient. Um, batch effects can be detected and removed, um, and the results, uh, and you can check the results. Um, over and under correction are possible, and those are not desirable. Um, selecting an integration method sometimes requires trying more than one. But Harmony is a good place to start in 2023. Next time we run this course, it might change, but uh, next year, but that's, um, I think, reasonable to, to uh, recommend now. Um, 